everyone, you're tuned in to the Maria Cosette Show, where the left brain meets the right. I have a fantastic guest today, Dr. David Antonian, so stay tuned for that interview. And of course, to find out more about our show, please visit MariaCosette.com. Stay with us. Hi, everyone. You are tuned in, and my guest is optometrist and photographer David Antonian. How are you? Good. How are you? Dr. Antonian. Thank you so much for coming on the show. So first and foremost, let's talk about your educational background and your practice. First and foremost, I want to thank you for inviting me over here and giving this opportunity. I'm very excited. My pleasure. I'm equally excited. Thank you. And you can call me David. Okay, yes. perfect. David. So let's talk about all the wonderful things you've done in your educational journey. And then, of course, your LA-based practice. So I... Graduated UCLA, I got my bachelor's in uh, biology, integrative biology and physiology. And then okay. afterwards I went to UC Berkeley and I got my doctor of optometry from there. Amazing. How was Berkeley? Uh, it was tough. It was tough. I'm but sure, yeah. but you know, at the end when you end up doing what you love, then it's it all ends right up being, there, right? Yeah, it yeah. ends up being very like rewarding. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, and then tell me a little bit about your practice. Uh, my practice, well, um, I started first, I was an associate optometrist for the last three years. And then I would see a lot of people that had this uh, things called binocular vision issues. And it's the way the eyes work together. Okay. And during a regular eye exam, these issues are not really uncovered easily. It requires a lot of time, a lot of equipment. So I would have to refer these patients out to another specialist where I was very kind of passionate about it, you know, I wanted to help them myself. So I decided to open up my own specialty clinic and be able to help these patients myself. Beautiful, beautiful. So I know that you're working on some really cool YouTube videos and I have to take advantage of the fact that I need to actually go to an eye exam. And so while we're here, let's talk about the exercises that you um, suggest for people to do at home. Sure, sure. Well, first, uh, in the, during the comprehensive binocular vision, what we check is the way the eyes work together because in regular eye exams, we check one eye at a time. Okay. And these evaluations, we check the way they work together. So depth perception, the strength of the muscles focusing. Right. So a lot of these functions are not working uh, properly. So these vision therapy exercises that they're kind of created to help these functions uh, recover or people recover their functions. Right. Um, these exercises are done repeatedly and then what happens is that it starts improving over time and people start noticing in their day-to-day -day activities. Right. So one of those exercises is for what we call convergence, which is the ability of your eyes to kind of come in inward whenever you're looking at something up close. Right. So that's one of the simple exercises that we can do right now, actually. Yeah, and let's do And what we do, do uh, we can use our finger. Okay. So we look at our finger All and right. as you bring in your finger close to your nose, you try to kind of keep your eyes turned in and try to see just one. Because okay. at some point, the finger's gonna split and you're gonna see double. I see. So okay. are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, Let's so do here it. we go. I mean, when, let me know when it becomes double. Yeah, it's double. All right, wow. Should I let so go? You, oh, yeah, okay. you actually have a great uh, convergence because nice. uh, a lot of people it's very common. They have what we call convergence insufficiency. Okay. And this issue actually causes headaches at the computer, a lot of eye strain and a lot of kind of blurriness. And so right now what you showed me is that you have a great convergence ability. Beautiful. See, do I really need to go to an exam? No, I'm kidding. I do. I, I always follow up on my <laughs> annual exams and everything. So even though the field of optometry is absolutely fascinating, Let's talk about photography and, in fact, how there are parallels between the two. Um, so I think it's beautiful that you followed photography as a hobby. So you specialize in, as you said, um, issues related to depth perception and then how the brain processes visual info. So in photography, how does the eye react functionality-wise um, as far as when it sees different shapes, colors, dimensions? When, when we look at a when we look at something, whether it's a photo or actual object, for example, uh, the light enters our eye, and 
it travels to our brain. The signals travel to our brain. And in our brain, we have different regions that are responsible for perceiving different things about the object we're looking at. Right. For example, color is in one region of the brain and shape is another region. Uh, facial recognition is actually in a different region and object and landscapes and whatnot. And they travel in these streams of signal and then at some point they combine and that's how you perceive something. Wow, that's very that is cool. so interesting. So when is it that you first, you know, gained an interest in photography? Uh, I loved um, I loved art for as, for as long as I remember. You know, I love paintings and I actually used to draw a lot when I was a little kid. But of course, I don't have a lot of time now. But with photography, you know, ever since I had a phone camera, I would literally take pictures of kind of objects and, right. um, you know, landscapes and sculpture and architecture all around me. And, you know, just I started feeling it more and more, you know, I was trying to see like little details about little things around me, you know, as I was walking to school or to yeah. work. And, you know, my, my sister noticing my love for photography, she actually got me a professional camera like Aww. for a graduation present. What a good and, sister. Yeah, and I've been, I've been using it every chance I get until recently. That is awesome. You know, our cameras, very advanced, uh, you know, our phone cameras actually, they're very advanced. So, you know, now it's easier to carry a phone. You know, rather yeah. than a big camera. Yeah, so when you don't have your big camera, actually, I know a lot of photographers, um, and that's the beauty of technology, there are a lot of amazing shots you can get with an iPhone. In fact, that's part of their marketing. Right. Um, yeah, and so do you add anything to the camera as far as features? Are there particular apps you use or anything? Yeah, there's uh, certain apps that, um, of course, we use during uh, photos, you know, to kind of edit out, like crop out the Correct. unnecessary detail to kind of focus the person's attention on yeah on a particular to, yeah. object so, like, generate or... depth yeah and, and, and we actually use uh, similar apps when we create uh, YouTube videos I forgot to mention that uh, so we create these YouTube videos and in these videos we're kind of recording how uh, to how to perform these vision therapy exercises that I prescribe my patients right so I use uh, a lot of the videos I actually make them on my phone and, really? I, and I use a lot of the apps to edit it out and put text and you know, Would you like to do marketing videos for my show? <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That's a creative outlet in itself. Yeah, is um, You know, it's not very often that, um, you know, doctors are doing their marketing videos. I had an attorney here who also did the same thing. And I think that's awesome that you Thank do you. that. So, yes, I have a lot more to talk to you about, about the wonderful and colorful world of photography. So stay with us. I have Dr. David Antonian. Hey everyone, we're back and you're tuned in to the Maria Cosette Show. My guest today is optometrist and photographer, Dr. David Antonian. So let us talk about the similarities between the eye and a construct of a camera. Well, that's actually something that I say quite often to my patients. I always compare the eye with the camera. Um, as we look at an object, you know, the light enters to our eye and lands on the back of our eyes, the sensitive part, the sensitive tissue called the retina, right. which is similar to what happens when you take a picture with a camera. The light falls on the sensor in the back of the camera. Right. And similar to the camera, as we look at different objects at different distances, what happens is that our eyes change their focus depending on the distance of the object, just like the camera's yeah. focus. That's so, so beautiful. Lot of, it's actually literally made like an eye. Yeah, camera. that's why I was saying earlier, yeah. I think it's so cool that you took up photography and you're an optometrist. I mean, it's a perfect <laughs> match. And so let's talk about what are the favorite things of yours to photograph? Uh, well, you know, like I, I said before, I see the little kind of details about certain things as, as, I, as they cross my path. Right. So I love to take pictures of inanimate objects. And I love nature and architecture, <gasps> sculptures, nature, yes. yeah, like trees and flowers and mountains and things like that, which is um, in Armenia, there's just there's so many things to take pictures of that I, I just I just fell in love. Yeah. Uh, so in Armenian, yeah, you would say, yeah. so that's a perfect segue. I want to hear about your experiences in Armenia. Tell me about uh, that. Yeah. Arme well, I hadn't been to Armenia for 20 years. I was only 11 when I came here. And I remember when we first came here, I would miss it a lot. So every single night I would have dreams of Armenia. Aww. And these dreams ended up fading away over time. So the first night we landed in Armenia and it was 4 a.m. And everything felt like a dream, just like I remember from right. when I was a kid. So I was just, I, like, I couldn't believe that it was real. And every single day I would wake up, I would wake up super early at 8 a.m. And I would try to take in as much 
as I could. So I would try to cross every cross through every street and try to see every landscape and yeah, every skull. And by every the way, every little intricacy. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is so beautiful. So I couldn't get enough. I, I would literally stay out until five, and I would try to take pictures of everything. Yeah. And what were your favorite places that you visited? And I was going to say, by the way, if you woke up at 8 a.m., there was probably nobody on the streets because I noticed that. Yeah. First time I went there, I was so excited. I'm like, I'm going to wake up super early. And then I went outside. There was nobody. Crickets. I'm yeah. like, they're like, oh, <laughs> anyway, um, so what are some of the favorite places you visited? The nature there is stunning. Yeah. So and the churches. And churches. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We went to a lot of monasteries and churches and and just it was amazing to me at the locations they were at and how difficult it must have been to build those churches right. and how beautiful they were. So I actually loved, I took a lot of pictures of, of the churches and the uh, kind of the forest, like Dilijan, we went to Dilijan and the nature <gasps> over there was so, so beautiful. Pretty, yeah. So yeah, so I took a lot of pictures there and of course you have on just uh, t tons of statues. Like there wasn't enough space in my phone to take right. pictures of things. Perfect. I had constantly like just uh, uploaded, you know, into the internet and then tr delete it and do it all over again. Yeah, and and I feel like, of course, we have a natural connection with the country because it's our home. But also, um, I love that in recent years it's gone so much publicity, right. as you know, and now it's on top lists and of places to visit. So I'm really excited about that, and of course, it's a beautiful country yeah, and it's is. ours, and I love it. Yeah. Um, and so this last question I ask all of my guests. And so I'd like to know why is it important for a professional to be multifaceted and to have a creative outlet or a hobby? I believe uh, having a creative outlet is very important because it kind of takes away from the everyday mundane functions that we have that could be repetitive and kind of boring. So that's our kind of chance to disconnect from reality and just escape into this uh, kind of space where we can, you know, where the time freezes and we get to appreciate the beauty around us. Yeah, perfect. Very well said. Thank you so much for coming Thank on the you for show. Having me. Of course, my pleasure. I wish you all the best of luck in all your Thank creative you. endeavors. And I hope you take the most brilliant pictures and everything and that you're inspired all along the way. So Thank stay you. with us. We have a lot more to talk about on the Maria Cosette show. The Art of Giving, where we spotlight a charitable organization. The Okno Shun Project is a canine assistant interventions provider in Armenia. They train rescue and therapy dogs who were once on the street or shelters. Okno Shun then provides underserved and vulnerable populations, such as children, disabled, and trauma survivors, with these socialized and trained canines. The founder, Nairi Karafian, is a young Armenian-American who once volunteered for Birthright Armenia. As a pre-veterinary student who is passionate about both her homeland and animals, her goal was to improve the public's perception and in turn the quality of life for rescue dogs in Armenia. Nairi has partnered with the Paros Foundation in order to introduce dog therapy in Yerevan, help provide education of stray and rescued dogs, and minimize their poor treatment. The goal is to incorporate dog therapy into Armenia's healthcare system in order to improve the reputation of dogs and thus increase their adoption rate. Oknu Shun collaborates with multiple centers to develop socially rehabilitated animals with the hopes of showcasing the positive qualities of dogs to the human population. On numerous visits to Armenia, it was really disheartening to see the homeless dogs often starving, pregnant, and lost. Armenia lacks animal welfare advocacy and has a severe stray dog problem with long-standing social and economic roots, which perpetuates the negative stigma around stray dogs. I am so proud to spotlight this project and encourage you to please contribute in some way. Like and follow on Facebook and Instagram, Oknushun. This is Check Up with Dr. Bastian, where we talk about health-related issues and get great medical advice from orthopedic surgeon based in Glendale, Dr. Sevak Bastian. How are you? I'm great, Maria. How are you? I'm great. So let's get to it. The topic today is preventive health. Why is preventive health so important in today's medicine? It's, it's key, Maria. It's very important. It's always best to get ahead of things. 
with respect to an injury or, or some sort of disease, um, you want to be on top of it before you have to start taking medications for it. Yeah. The big ones are diabetes and, and blood pressure. A lot, of, a lot of people have this and they don't take their medications sometimes because they feel like they don't feel it day to day so they, they get behind and right. then all of a sudden it's, it's too late. So it's always good to stay on top of these things, stay ahead and hopefully prevent it. I mean, diet, exercise, good life habits, no, no smoking, simple things. These are all going to be key to give you longevity in your life and also good health. Yes. Not just long life, but good life. Absolutely. And so, which brings me to my next question. Are there any annual screenings you suggest for both men and women? Yeah, there's a, there's a few that are recommended. There's a few that are optional. And there's a few that are different based on your family history. Right. Um, so, obviously, a risk factor of developing anything medical is if you've had it before or someone in your family's had it before. Correct. So that always changes the screening process. I highly recommend doing at least once a year physicals. If you're diabetic, uh, more often, like every six months, get your hemoglobin A1C checked. Those, those, that's a key uh, blood marker that it would be ideal to keep a track of. Right. Um, specific screenings, 50 and up, men and women need colon cancer screening. Unfortunately, that's a colonoscopy. Uh, but we all got to we all got to do it and it's every five to ten years after that based on any risk factors such as family history or your own personal history. Right. Um, a big one that I like to always stress about as an orthopedic surgeon is good bone health and looking of for course. osteoporosis. Yes. It's, it affects women more than men and we recommend what's called a DEXA scan. It's a bone density scan. Uh, on everybody. Um, it's always good to have good bone health, take your vitamins. And that's like a 10 minute scan, the DEXA scan. Yeah, it's, Super a, quick. it's very quick. Yeah. It gives us great data. We can start you on a, another medication or, or hormonal therapy to, to increase your bone density right. so that we can prevent a broken bone after yeah. like a fall, uh, which is a, a tough problem to have. So why not know about it beforehand? Absolutely. So a women over 40, it's recommended to start checking for breast cancer and that Correct. could be with a physical exam or a mammogram or an ultrasound. Other routine screening that we could consider are um, just your things that will be caught up kind of on a physical exam on your annual physical, such as checking your heart and lungs. Key, it's always good to get ahead of a murmur uh, if you pick it up. Actually, I have a family member who just got that picked up. And we're glad that we picked it up early because now we're working it up. And it's good to know this thing earlier yeah. rather than later. So now it's time to debunk the myth. So every segment we're going to debunk a popular myth. So today's myth is drinking eight glasses of water a day. Is that myth or truth, Dr. Bastian? So drinking water is always great. There is no objective specific number of this is the number of ounces you're supposed to drink. It's always different based on man or woman and your, your, your weight. Um, a good way to judge it is really the color of your urine. Uh, that's kind of a good way to know if you're hydrated or not. If it's clear, that means you're pretty well hydrated. Hydration is key. It's like flushing out your system. The solution to pollution is dilution. And that works not just with water in, like in the that. body, but yeah. it works with infections. It's what we do surgically to clear infections. We just we open it up, decompress it, and then wash it. Solution to pollution is dilution. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for checking in, Dr. Bastian. Until next time. Stay tuned for more of the Maria Cosette Show. Know the Greats, where we spotlight a legend. Joseph Nips invented the first camera. He developed his interest upon working with his brother Claude on various experiments. The very first trials and errors with lithography led to the potential of using light to produce images in 1816. These images he later referred to as heliography and resulted in the earliest known surviving photograph made in a camera. In 1827, Nips traveled to England to visit his brother, and while there, he was introduced to famed botanist Francis Bauer, who recognized Nips's discovery. Bauer encouraged him to introduce and present the heliographs on paper to the Royal Society. The first results obtained spontaneously by the action of light, it was called, and rejected by the throne for a lack of full disclosure of the detailed process of inventing such a device. 
Unfortunately, Nips passed away in 1833 dreaming of his discovery gaining proper recognition. In 1839, Daguerre's photographic invention overshadowed Nips's heliograph. That's a wrap for the Maria Cosette Show. Much love to my guest today, Dr. David Antonian. It was so nice to talk about science and photography. And of course, Dr. Sevalk Bastian for stopping in for a checkup. That's all, everyone. Remember to stay creative. I'm out.